Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring altered states of consciousness and enhanced human functioning. My guest is Professor Etzel Cardenia, who is the Thorson Professor of Psychology at Lund University in Sweden, where he is also the director of the Center for Research on Consciousness and Anomalous Psychology. He has served as the president of the Society of Psychological Psychological Hypnosis and the Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis. He is also the current editor of the Journal of Parapsychology. In addition, he has edited several th anthologies, including Altering Consciousness, Multidisciplinary Perspectives, Varieties of Anomalous Experience, and Parapsychology, a Handbook for the 21st Century. And now, I will switch over to the internet video. Well, welcome, Etzel. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, when it comes to looking at altered states of consciousness, you're, that's been your main focus uh, in, in, for a long time. In fact, as I recall, that's why you went to UC Davis to study with uh, Charlie Tart, who was one of my professors as well. Yes, and there is a personal history behind this, because when I was studying psychology, clinical psychology in Mexico, I was also doing theater, experimental theater, and it was a very physically demanding type of theater, ritual theater, where they, they took us basically to the, to the limits of our endurance, and then they would say, the directors, continue. <laughs> and then it got interesting. And... Uh, and just by doing a lot of uh, mindful effort throughout that, I suddenly realized that I was able to do things that I would ordinarily have thought I would have been unable to do. So in a sense, this paper on altered states or altered consciousness and enhanced functioning is the product of what happened to me back in Mexico decades ago while I was doing experimental theater. And then I realized that the people in my, my professors in the psychology program had nothing to say, didn't know anything about what was happening to me. Not that it was happening continuously, but the extraordinary events. So I thought, well, I have to find out someone who can teach me something about this. I know practically it happens. I know that I'm able to endure pain that I thought I would not be able to do, that I'm able to endure a lot of effort with, that I thought I would not have been able to do. And uh, the only people I found at that time were Robert Ornstein and Charlie Tart, or Charles Tart. You know, back then, of course, it was Charles Tart. So I wrote to him uh, from Mexico as I was finishing my clinical studies and said, I have read, I think, all of your papers and I was so naive because I probably had read about six or seven of his papers, <laughs> not more than a hundred at that time. Uh, but I thought, well, five or six, that must be about everything he has published. And it took me a while, but I was able finally to persuade University of California Davis to take me and he to take me as his student because I was the, his last UC Davis student. He did not take any any other after me. So maybe he just thought, I don't want anybody else like him anymore. <laughs> and he stopped. <laughs> that. <laughs> With regard to that paper that was published in a mainstream journal of the American Psychological Association, I was struck, first of all, by the title, because the first thing you refer to is, uh, I think, derangement, that the majority view in psychology uh, was that altered states of consciousness represent a, a derangement of normal functioning, not an enhancement. Correct. And uh, the derangement comes really from a translation of a letter by the great French poet Rimbaud, where he said, in order to be a visionary poet, you, or in order to be a visionary, you have to derange your senses. And in his case, the, 
the morale is mixed because on the one hand he became at a very young age 18 19 years of age he had revolutionized revolutionized poetry not only french poetry but poetry overall and he was done with it around 21 years of age and he got into drunken bra drunken brawl sorry drunken brawls and uh, all kinds of drugs got into fight with his married partner not married to him but married to his wife and then became a trader of ivory and slaves so he was an extraordinary poet and at the same time he was a very disordered individual at least as far as his life he, he died young so in some ways he would exemplify what some might say well if you get into an altered state or if you pursue that you're going to end in very dire straits and i thought well no no that is not necessarily the case that can indeed happen we know that people get addicted to drugs uh, sometimes not so not psycho psychedelics but other drugs because they want to to change their state and they are not enhancing anything they are wrecking their lives but i wanted in a sense to emphasize the other side are there some ways in which people who end up having unusual states or cultivate them in a long time there's some ways in which they enhance their functioning and i would say the answer is quite clearly yes well i suppose in addition to rambo you have the example of samuel coleridge and his great poem uh, kubla khan which yes. I, I understand was written under the influence of opium Yes, and uh, if I recall well, he said that he had had that vision in a dream, and he had just transcribed what he had seen, which was a romantic embellishment, because there, there, is, there are some drafts where you can see that he was really editing what he was saying. So he wasn't just transcribing this vision that he had. Uh, and Coleridge had also a difficult life. He was drug addict had a number of problems so and at the same time he he ended up producing some of the most extraordinary stronger intense beautiful poetry of his time so um, he was right there in that very thin edge and at times he particularly I think later he fell but mm. um, yes he was yes another great example of some someone who in some ways was able to profit from the visions he had but was not able to be wise enough to keep in check the drug addiction and all the disordered life alongside with his relationships and so on that he had well the the use of altered states of consciousness to achieve uh uh, ecstasy or artistic accomplishments or athletic performance uh, goes back to ancient times. Yes, there is an extraordinary book by a um, good friend of mine, Julia Justinova. She's a classicist in um, Greek culture. And what she has done has to bring together all of the various traditions, writings of the great philosophers of the time, uh, Plato, certainly, even though he may have the reputation for being just a logician, a, a very cold, analytical person, and he shows that in the core of this search among the classic Greeks to find a greater understanding of reality, altered states were a primordial path. It wasn't just logic, not even close to I mean, for example, there are the uh, Eleusinian mysteries. We don't know much about what happened, but it, it certainly appears as if altered states of consciousness were a, a very important part of that ritual, and all of the leading citizens of ancient Athens uh, went through those mysteries. Indeed, and it, they did that for a very long time, for many hundreds of years. But not only them, even if you look at the, what most people would assume very ordered, logical Aristotle, uh, you can find that he has some um, allusions here and there where he's talking about altered states as something potentially positive. 
And there is one passage uh, that uh, I found in which he, in a sense, is anticipating Gansfeld. He's mm -hmm. saying, well, if you are able to somehow reduce the stimulation of your senses, you may be able to get a deeper understanding of reality. So not something that ordinarily we would expect to we would expect from Aristotle, but obviously that was current currency in the thoughts that he had, not only, not only with Plato and of course Socrates, who was well known to engage in altered states and to be able to endure tremendous cold and hardships and would go into altered states to receive information, would have his voice, his diamond talking to him. Well, as a uh, psychologist, you're really interested in uh, nailing down the nuances of how altered states of consciousness influence uh, human functioning. And I know one of the, the very first distinctions you make is between the induction procedure or technique uh, ver versus the altered state itself. Absolutely. And... Uh that is something that is not at all new to me. You know, the work of Charlie Tart, he wrote that in 77, if not earlier, uh, because it is obvious. If you do, for example, hypnosis, you do a hypnotic induction in a room with 100 people, as I have done dozens, maybe hundreds of times, and what you find is that what you do will affect most people to a certain degree. Well, they may feel a bit more relaxed, they may have thought that uh, the procedure did not last as long as it did. And then you will find that there are a few people that really had some unusual experiences, even if you did not mention them, that maybe just spontaneously started feeling that they were floating out of their bodies, things of that sort. And then there are people who are just thinking, when is this going to end? This is so boring. So when, people, when you find still in some publications nowadays that somebody can say well uh, I did this and so this group was hypnotized that doesn't mean anything because unless you find out what were the actual experiences of the people you the best you can say well probably some people were somewhat affected perhaps a few people were quite a bit affected and some people were just bored and were not affected at all and you know when mm -hmm. I, I did a study with the EEGs taking very highly hypnotizable and people who are not low, no, low hypnotizable, many people who are responsive to hypnotic inductions. And not only did we find that the low hypnotizables did not show the pattern of the high hypnotizables, but they seem to show the opposite pattern. They, whereas, for example, the high hypnotizables, more of the activity became more occipital, if you will. It went more towards visions and emotions for the low hypnotizables, it became more frontal. They probably were more mind-wandering, being more analytical, thinking, when is this going to end? So it's not even that some people are not affected, but they may be affected in the opposite way. I was fortunate myself when I was in high school. I learned the art of self-hypnosis and used it very deliberately to uh, prepare for examinations. Uh, I remember in high school they had something called the P the SAT test. I think students still take it. And then the PSAT, the preliminary. So I took the preliminary test. I got a, a certain grade, which is to predict your performance when you take the, the big. SAT test. Uh, but I hypnotized myself before the big a SAT test, and my scores jumped way up, uh, well, much more than two standard deviations above what the PSAT would have predicted. So that got me convinced while I was still a teenager of, of the power of hypnosis in a positive way. And in this case, I would say the power of hypnosis with a person who was very motivated and who obviously, given your later career, who was very introspective, who was very psychologically oriented. That, that's all true, yeah. 
But I, it, it seems to me that the uh, literature on hypnosis is, is enormous. The things that people can do, uh, raise warts or remove warts from the skin just by the power of uh, a suggestion or an altered state. But I, I am aware that there's still controversy as to what causes these hypnotic effects. Is it the suggestion? Is it the social pressure? Is it the altered state of consciousness? Well, um, things are complicated. <laughs> Whenever we talk about something complex in human beings, things there is never, I think, a simple answer. It's just this. Uh, but one thing that we know is that they are real, that from the studies, doing with comparison groups and so on, that they do happen, that there is something in the hypnotic procedure that makes a difference because you can do the same thing without using hypnosis, just make suggestions, saying, okay, well, just imagine it, and nothing happens. And then if you say, well, I'm going to use the magical word hypnosis, then something will occur. But I think the core, the mystery of hypnosis, as well as many other similar disciplines, is that we have no real understanding of how mental events affect directly physiological events, which is what this is happening. Because when you're saying, well, I'm going to make this word vanish. Okay, well, that is an intention. But when you do that and it works, does the person doing it have any idea about the physiology of words? What would need to happen continuously? No. It just occurs. And we have no idea. And nobody has an idea with regard to hypnosis or with regard to placebo. So you may have... Some people, including Charlie Tart and other people, may say, well, maybe there is a psychokinetic effect of mind affecting directly matter. But that just moves the question one level farther. Okay, but how does that happen? And, and we really don't know. It, it does seem to me that one similarity between hypnosis and psychokinesis is that they seem to be goal-oriented. As you pointed out, uh, we don't know the mechanism of how a wart would be raised or a wart would disappear. But if you tell a, a person or give them the suggestion, a highly suggestible person, it, it will just happen. And similarly with psychokinetic instructions, uh, it's... It, you know, the instruction seems to result in an effect related to the goal, not the mechanism. Exactly. And just what you were saying now, if you go back to the work of Helmut Schmidt, he tested this directly. He would have people try to affect a very simple random mechanism, and they were able to do it better than would be expected by chance. And then he just changed the mechanism so that it would be very difficult and complicated and so on, and it worked the same. So the issue did not seem to have to do with how complicated or simple the, the mechanism had to be affected. It was just, indeed, the intention of what do I want the outcome to be. And once I know that, sort of the, the material causes in the Aristotelian sense do not matter. It just happens. Well, since we're talking about Helmut Schmidt and parapsychology and, and psychokinesis, uh, one of the strongest findings of, of your paper is that altered states of consciousness seem to be psi-conducive. They enhance psychic functioning uh, more so than our ordinary consciousness seems to do. Yes, I would, I would say that the pattern is there. It doesn't mean that every study finds that, but and this goal would go back first to Chuck Onerton, who was doing work in the 80s and 90s and so on, who in a sense moved the field from the Joseph Banks Ryan, let's just do brood amount of studies with thousands or hundreds of thousands of trials, so before people die of boredom, we will find some kind of significant effect, versus Chuck Onerton saying, well, let's try to figure out which states seem to be more conducive. And I think he was right on the money. Now, things are still difficult, because, for instance, in the studies we have done here at Lund University, we have found in two studies, the second replicating the first, essentially, that people who felt they were in an altered state 
and we measure that with a questionnaire, people who felt that way were more successful at the psi task they had. When they did not feel they were in an altered state, they did not do better than chance. But when they were in an altered state, and these were highly hypnotizable people, and this means that not all highly hypnotizable people were equally affected. So even with a selected group, you may have some people that, well, maybe they're worried about something else. Maybe that induction doesn't work for them. But for the ones that did, it seems to work better. And then you go to the work of Serena Ronnie Dougal, uh, who has worked with meditators, some of them who have been doing it for decades. And in one of her papers, uh, what she reported was that the people who had been doing it for a long time were more successful, significantly so, but also they were more successful at knowing what, how certain they could be of their guesses. So when they said, yes, I'm sure that this is the correct decision or this is the correct guess, they usually were correct, were right. And when they mm -hmm. express some kind of uncertainty, then it could go either way. So one could say, and it goes along with the general philosophy of most areas, most contemplative traditions, that you figure out how your mind works, what comes from your own particular history, uh, and what comes from other sources. And this is a process that requires decades. I do not know if you meditate, I would assume you must have some kind of practice like that. But it, it's not something that happens easily or rapidly. It takes a long time. And after you do that, you're not going to be always correct, but you start figuring out, well, that thing, that image or that feeling doesn't seem to have anything to do with what happened to me during the day or, or recently. So probably has something to do with somebody else. And then you check it out. And you may be right. You're, you're describing now what could be a very complex uh, experimental procedure. First, you have an induction. Then you want to measure, somehow get a report from the person as to how effective that induction procedure was. Then you've got a uh, an ESP task, which could be uh, something that a person in an altered state is not really inclined to do in the first place. And then you add on top of that uh, what is sometimes known as a confidence call. How, how confident were they in the ESP guess? Uh, so all of that could sort of pull a person out of the altered state that you're trying to create in the first place. Correct. And one, one needs to calibrate these this aspects very carefully. And I think one of the problems we have with psychology or parapsychology is that we make a number of assumptions that are incorrect. One of the assumptions is, well, we have a group and they are essentially the same. No, that's not true. And uh, we're going to do something with these people who are basically passive. No, that's not true either. There, some of them are more motivated. Some of them will want to do the thing you want them to do. Some of them will just want to be there to get a cinema ticket because that's what they get from doing our experiments here in Lund. So yeah. you have a lot of different motivations and one of the things that is difficult is that you're not able, or at least it is very difficult to have one person that you can test for a long time again and again and again. So that you create first a good bonding, and second, the person and you start figuring out what works best for you. So, uh, and maybe this is unsolvable because we have very complicated and difficult lives. So I know that if I ask student participants here, well, I would like you to do an experiment for two hours, they may do it. But if I ask them, would you like to do 10 experiments of two hours each? They're very likely to say, thank you, but no, thank you. And probably mm -hmm. that's what you would need to do. And that's what the people back in the time of the Society for Psychical Research, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, could do with their mediums, Mrs. Piper, Mrs. Leonard, they spent a lot of time with them. So they were also able to figure out what happens in what circumstances do these people do not seem to be successful? In which circumstances do these people seem to be successful? But that took a long time. It is like becoming a somewhat at least competent violin player. 
It is not going to happen in two hours or even in a weekend. Now, I know William James uh, once wrote that progress in parapsychology, and I think he was also referring to states of consciousness as well. It, we can't expect to see progress decade by decade as in other disciplines, that this work is so deep we have to look for progress by the half century or by even by the century. Now, you know, I wish we had more William James as maybe this would go faster, <laughs> but the, that a person of that genius just comes once every hundred years or less. Now, you know, it's interesting because in your work as an experimental psychologist, it's, it, you know, it's very difficult. It's very painstaking. There's so many variables to take into account. But I, I remember in my student days at Berkeley, I was once invited by the uh, University of California swim team to come in and give a talk on parapsychology. And they weren't interested so much in the research. They're interested in the practical applications. And this was the national championship swim team, and they were just eager for anything that might help them have just a slight edge. So, uh, you know, the idea that altered states and parapsychology uh, might be useful, they, they just gobbled it up. They were very happy to, to learn about it. Uh, so I would think that uh, various... Uh, parties or groups of people engaged in practical pursuits might be more interested in your research than other experimentalists. Well, I haven't been approached by, by the Swedish Olympic team, uh, but you are right in so far as, particularly with those very select people, even just a small advantage can make a big difference. I once heard a, a TED talk that was just giving the, the amount of people, the champions doing the 100 meter race. And in decades, it was like beep, 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 beep. The, the difference was something that was even difficult to discern. But that just fraction of a second made a difference between, let's say, a bolt and the person who came fifth. So, yeah. yes, I one would expect that if things became a bit more open, one should be able to say, well, this is one possible path. In a sense, it is happening, but mostly with business, because I know that I think you have interviewed Joe McMonigal, uh, and he works for business people, for people who are looking in oils and so on. And I know I have heard Joe say in some conference that even though he may be perhaps the most successful remote viewer in history, that at his best, he is right about 50% of the time. Obviously, when the odds are unknown, not when it is 50-50. <laughs> it is that for those people who know that be having some of an edge may make a big difference, they can take the risk to be wrong sometimes or to be slightly better than the competitor. So I hope that you know, if things start becoming more open, and if we were to have a psychology of the whole person, one should say, well, perhaps altered states is not something that, go that is going to give an edge to every athlete, but it may give a bit of an edge to some athletes. So let's identify who they are and let's work with them. You know, uh, you brought up Joe McMonigal, who is known as uh, maybe the most famous uh, remote viewer. Uh, but one of the interesting things about all of his accomplishments and those of other remote viewers, to, to my understanding, they claim that they do it in a normal state of consciousness. Some of them even are smoking cigarettes or sitting at their desk while they're doing remote viewing. They, they claim that this is everyday consciousness, at least Many of them do. Others say, well, it's a mildly relaxed state. Uh, but they, the data from remote viewing suggests, you know, a very high degree of uh, psychic functioning in the absence of an altered state of consciousness. Yes, absolutely. And I do not see that as um, a contradiction to, to my main tenet, because my main tenet is not that alterations of consciousness are going to be necessary for everyone. And I would again go back to hypnosis. There is 
dear friend passed away some years ago, Ted Barber, TX Barber. Uh, mm. Most people misquote him. They think, oh, he was against hypnosis. No, he wasn't at all. He was a very thorough person, and at the beginning, when things were done sloppily, he came and said, no, this is, this is the way they should be done so that we know better. But towards the end of his life, he came with a theory of hypnosis, and he said, well, the thing is that maybe we need to think that there are different theories for different people. And he said there are three, in a sense, high hypnotizable people come in three flavors. He did not say flavors, but in three different types. There are the sort of fantasy-prone individuals who have a lot of fantasy, visual, or auditory, and that is how they experience their hypnotic event, their hypnotic state. That's how it works for them. And he said, then there is, and these are people who typically do not have a traumatic event in their lives. They have had a reasonable life. Maybe, maybe they had artistic parents or parents who engaged in talking to them, mm -hmm. telling them stories. So there was that group. And then he said, there's the dissociative group, people who just go blank. You give them a suggestion, they do it. They do not know how they do it. They do not have as much imagery as the first group. They may feel that they are, in a sense, compelled to do it. And so they do it. And then there is a third group of people who do well. And these are the bright, very motivated people who do not have a lot of imagery, do not have a history of maybe abuse or hardship or trauma, but are able to figure out how to perform well in the task. And he said, so... What has happened in the hypnosis field is that the different schools have assumed that they have worked with one of those groups. And they have assumed, well, what we found with that group must apply to everyone. And that is not true. You have different people doing things different way. And I have come to realize, I think, more or less recently that probably that is the same thing that happens for Psy. So that I agree, I would say, Yes, one can, one can accommodate the McMonagall of the world and say, for some people, maybe just being a bit relaxed, a bit focused, that's all they need, nothing else. Why? We need to find out more, but that's all they need. But for some people, they really need to go into a state where they feel more connected with everything else, they feel that time and space are not the same, and that is when they are able to do well. So I would say that there are at least those two groups in parapsychology. Mm -hmm. And in hypnosis, we did research here at Lund, and we were able to support Barber's hypothesis. We found that there were at least two groups of high hypnotizables. There were the people who were more a lot of imagery, and then there were the people who were more, I feel that I lose control, I don't have as much imagery, and they were both doing very well in hypnotic tests through different ways. So it goes back to my notion, sorry, mm -hmm. last, last sentence about this, that we have wrong, false assumptions in psychology. We assume, oh, there must be a law like there is for insentient objects. So we find a law for something about humans. It must apply to all humans. No, there are different procedures, and some of them may apply for different people who, have, who differ in their traits, cognitive styles, emotional life maybe the way they carry their bodies, who knows, their genes. But we have different mechanisms. It is very difficult to find a law that will apply to every human being. I imagine uh, that perhaps the goal of your research would be to find out what type of person would benefit most from hypnosis or meditation or <laughs> autogenic training or uh, uh, entheogens. But to an extent, yes, I do not, I'm not so much in practical things, but one of the issues that I have been looking at is who are the people who have unusual, maybe even mystical experiences just spontaneously in the laboratory and what is happening to the brain while that is occurring. So that's what I have been doing. And so I can discriminate between the people who are highly hypnotizable, who can have those spontaneous experiences and the people who do not have them. So we have a, an exuberance of richness, of variety of people, which is what you would expect actually from evolutionary theory, rather than a little cone that is making everybody be homogeneous 
and think or react or act in the same way. One of the most interesting findings that you report is that the use of psychedelic drugs can help uh, combat various conditions like addictions, alcoholism. Yes, uh, it is not an area that I myself have researched on, but I have followed the literature and I know there is a new um, review of the literature and it basically reinforces what I had written there, that there is now, I would say, substantial body of evidence showing that, at least with the small groups that it had been tested, that psychedelics can help a number of different conditions. Now, again, I think when one refines it, one will find out that this will not be a procedure that will help everyone, the same as with other procedures, but that it will help substantially some people for whom other kinds of procedures have not been helpful. And it sort of makes sense because <laughs> if you think for a moment, if the psychedelic experience for some is tremendous, it gives you enormous insight on your mind, on your life, on the meaning of it all. And you have been a, a, an addict because you have felt emptiness in your life. You suddenly have a revelation. So why would you need to continue poisoning yourself when you suddenly had an inkling that there was some kind of revelation that, at least to you, makes sense. I have also heard that uh, Vipassana meditation can help uh, free people from heroin addiction. Yes, uh, uh, and there is research where you, you can use hypnosis to get the same procedures. So, you know, eventually, I think if one were to do a clinic, what one would need to do is to have specialists in different techniques and research mm -hmm. and say, well, we find out that this technique works better for this kind of people with this kind of problem. And then that's what we do. Yeah. Now, I think one of the most interesting uh, suggestions that came out of your paper on altered states is the idea that some altered states of consciousness may uh, enable people to uh, directly experience uh, aspects of what I would call ontological reality that are, that are not available to our normal state of consciousness. Yes. And... Um and now that is something that is, in a sense, at the of my interests as well, as well, because you have had a number of mystical traditions, and I think they have, not uncommonly, and particularly by psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, they, neurologists, they have deemed to be the product of faulty brains or psychopathology. And I'm writing a paper with a number of quotations of people essentially saying that, oh, you had an experience, you felt that you weren't one with everything, so something wrong with you. And when you look at the issue that people who engage in contemplative meditation and have been meditating for decades, or people who are in an altered state where they feel more in a union, that they are able to obtain information that they should not be able to obtain, information that is temporally or spatially distant, then I think it brings some support to the claim that, yes, in some way, non-consciously, subconsciously, ontologically, however you want to phrase it, there is a way in which we are able to go beyond ourselves and have an inkling. Now, does that mean that all of the experience that a mystic has has to be accurate? No, the same way that not all of the experiences of a person in an ordinary state have to be accurate, but it states that there is some evidential support for a person saying, well, I have had an enhanced vision of reality. I have been able to find out something that is demonstrable that I should not have been able to find out from my restricted body. So there, is, there must be some way in which we are interconnected. I do not know if with the whole universe, but at least with people who are important with us or other beings, not only people, animals and other events. You also cite the research, I think, of Don Hoffman, who, who points out that our normal state of consciousness, which we think 
provides us with direct access to reality uh, is actually much more iconic, that the brain, as powerful as it is, is not capable of processing all of the uh, information coming in through our senses. So what we think of as reality are, are actually icons, almost like looking at a computer screen. Yes, and Don's uh, studies are novel, but the idea is not new at all. You go to Henri Berceau, William James, F.W.H. Myers, they were talking about, mm -hmm. well, what the brain is doing is filtering. There is so much information, and if we were able to suddenly start processing it all, we would go crazy. We would not be able to function well, and that is even without considering that our sensory organs, for example, are extremely limited. There are so many other ranges, let's say, within the electromagnetic spectrum that are not even within the range of what we're able to see or listen to or whatever. So the idea goes to them, but you can continue to go back. You go through the way of Kant's, uh, Kant's ideas, the, the categories. You go to Plato and the notion that what we have we get something that is useful and beautiful because I would not kick there. Whatever we experience for me is extraordinary. You know, I may not be able to experience everything that maybe is in my subconscious, but it's extraordinary to hear a beautiful piece of music, a Shostakovich symphony, go to the field and see all of the leaves around you. That's extraordinary. But amazingly, there is just that's just a tiny sliver, probably, of what there is. And that is even without getting into the issue of time, where we think, well, just in this moment of time, there's just so much that it would make you crazy to consider it all. But maybe, as perhaps psychology suggests, and some experiments in physics suggest, we may be able, and Einsteinian's block model of time suggests, well, maybe we could be able to also have glimpses of the past and the future, not only by remembrance, but something else. So what we have is a wonderful gift, but <laughs> if you think that is all, you probably are uh, sinning of hubris. Dr. Etzel Cardenio, this has been a fascinating discussion. I know we could probably keep talking all day long about the amazing insights that people get from different altered states of consciousness and uh, the hundreds of ways in which human performance can be enhanced. Uh, still, I think we, we've we covered uh, the, the overview of the field, and you're continuing to uh, do this research. You've been doing it for decades, and I know uh, you've got much more ahead of you. So, Thank you so much for being with me. Thanks, Jeff.